Hey there and welcome to this video where we're going to discuss why mushrooms are ideal for urban agriculture. So it might sound like a bit of a trend, urban agriculture, urban farming, but it's been around for millennia. So I was lucky enough a few years back to visit the ancient city of Machu Picchu in Peru, did a beautiful hike up there and once you get there you can see how cleverly built this whole city was. So they had terraces to grow their crops that were nicely angled to the sun just to prolong the whole growing season. But they also made use of water conservation. So this is an example of going about growing food in a systematic, in a clever way. And uh, there's plenty of these examples. But I think from, for now the trend is increasing. It's becoming more and more due to simple statistics like the UN who think that by 2030 two and a half billion people will live in our cities. That, to put it in a different context, is two out of every three people on the planet. They will live in cities. So it makes complete sense to once again look at where we're cultivating our food. So at the moment it's all industrial scale and it's often very far away from where the major cities are. So there's a lot of transport involved and that doesn't need to be the case. So if you look at a company like Gotham Greens in the US and there's plenty of other examples, but just look at these um, people. They typically produce in greenhouses, that glass houses that they put on top of existing buildings and they're doing so very successfully. So they've got five of these quite large farms on the go at the moment. So a lot of urban farming projects tend to focus on growing leafy greens and that makes a lot of sense because they're something which is best eaten when fresh and if you can supply them close to where people live you've got a distinct advantage as a local producer in doing so. Um, but mushrooms are actually pretty similar in the same way that they're best eaten when fresh and so we think it's a crop that works really well in cities but on top of that there are a number of other reasons why it works particularly well. Uh, first up, a lot of uh, people that grow leafy greens um, grow them actually inside with LED lighting and it actually uses quite a lot of energy to grow plants under lights. Mushrooms, however, don't need all that much energy in the, way, uh, in the form of lighting and so they work uh, really well actually growing them indoors for that reason. On top of that and related to it is the fact that um, mushrooms are grown indoors means you can make use of loads of empty spaces which all cities have in different forms. So whether that's uh, underground basements or old car parks, uh, bomb shelters, or whether it could be just empty office blocks or industrial buildings, growing mushrooms in these disused spaces is one way of regenerating the space, bringing it back into life and making use of those buildings. On top of that, mushrooms are a high value crop and they fetch a, a high value for a given space. So you can produce a lot of mushrooms and get a good yield in a certain square meterage. Um, and so it enables you to grow high value crop in small spaces which in a city where space is usually at a premium this is something that's really important as well. And on top of that there's the fact that uh, mushrooms, like I said, they work really well when they're fresh and so you have an advantage as a local mushroom producer to produce them in a city over mushrooms that have been grown from far away. So all of these ideas are something that excited Eric and I a lot many years ago on top of the fact that you can grow mushrooms on coffee grounds. So back in 2011, we were really inspired by this idea. And um, we've got another video actually, if you're interested in learning more about how to check out, uh, check out that video on how to grow mushrooms on coffee. So at the time we, we were driving in and out to the city where we're based here is around about 45 minutes from the nearest city. But we were so interested in this idea that we would just jump in the car every day, head up to the city and pick up all the coffee grounds and bring it back to our farm here in the countryside and it didn't take us long to realize that that wasn't the most efficient way of doing it. Uh, we realized it made more sense to have the farm in the city um, so we wanted to kind of show this and uh, showcase this idea a little bit um, so we found a space, a disused office block uh, right in the center of a city called Exeter which is in the southwest of England and we set up a farm there that we ran for a few years which was a really cool project um, so let's take a look at what that farm looked like. So Adam mentioned how we're in the city and that had a few different um, benefits for us. It was a great time because there's a lot of coffee waste in the city and the coffee waste is ideal to grow mushrooms on because the brewing process, it renders the coffee waste pasteurized and that's the point when you want to introduce it to the mushroom spawn and then it can just thrive and grow away on this food that it's found that we've introduced it to. 
So Adam also mentioned we were right in the centre of the city and that's had a few advantages for us as well because that meant we could just collect using a bike and a bike trailer and that saved a bunch of heavy lifting because we used to lift it with bin bags over a shoulder and then take it back to the car. So that was all really uh, much improvement for us. The other thing is that because we were so central, there were so many cafes around us that we could just choose the ones we wanted to collect from and all of the cafes Depending on the time of year, we collected between five and ten cafes, their waste, we took it back to the farm. All of those cafes were within a stone's throw, really, 150 metres or so from the farm. And that simplifies things a lot, so we could get our hands on a lot of coffee waste within 40 minutes or so. So that was step one, collecting by bike. We would then take it up three stories high, take it to the mixing and inoculation room. And that was a, not a really fanciful room, it just has a compost tumbler. And with the compost tumbler, we would introduce the spawn to the coffee waste, we would add a bit of straw, and that's the first step. And then all the magic starts to happen. From then, we would take it into the incubation room. So in the incubation room, that's a lovely stage. It's very visual, you can see here on the slide, from left to right how the layers just start to join up and how the mushrooms eventually form. This was just set, a scene set basically, this wasn't how we fruited most of the mushrooms because that would be the next stage. And you can see here in the fruiting room just bag after bag after bag of fruiting mushrooms and it's just an absolute miracle to see. You can see this in the time lapse here, it just grows so quickly. And that comes back to the point Adam made earlier that you don't need so much space it's a really high yielding crop. And for instance, in this space you can see here, which was about 20 square meters, we could produce 75 kilograms of mushrooms every week. So that's the excitement of the fruiting stage. And obviously for us, the other benefit then was the next stage is you are basically where your customers are as well. So what we used to do is we would supply, for instance, the real food store, which again was only about a hundred meters away from our farm. And they would sell local ethically produced food to local customers. So all of this, you now get the sense, if you think about this as a system, it's a wonderful example of how you can turn what is essentially a large waste stream into hyper-local food without any of those food mines. So as you can imagine, this concept of turning waste in the middle of a city into delicious, healthy food really resonates with people. Um, but of course, we're not the only people that have been doing this. Um, there are a number of other urban mushroom farms out there. Um, for example, there's Rottersvam, who are in the Netherlands, and they used to grow mushrooms inside an old swimming pool. Uh, they actually had a fire there a couple of years ago, and so they've rebuilt their farm in shipping containers in another location um, in Rotterdam. Uh, they are growing mushrooms on coffee and supplying them in the local area every week. There's also a similar project in Brussels in Belgium called Permafungi, um, also grow mushrooms on coffee grounds and they also make mushroom kits similar to the ones that we make uh, for people to grow mushrooms at home. And um, also a project in Australia called Lifecycle. Uh, we actually had the pleasure of helping those guys to set up a few years back and they're growing mushrooms on coffee grounds in Melbourne but they've also um, developed a program to help set other mushroom farms up in other areas. Their aim is to have one in every urban area in Australia. Uh, by 2020. Um, so as you can see, it's a concept that catches on, it works really well, um, and it's really nice to see this spreading to all the other places. It's something that we've always wanted to see happen over the years. So of course, this won't work for everybody. Um, like all small food growing projects, you're gonna face all sorts of different challenges. Um, obviously, growing in cities, one of the biggest challenges is finding the right space and in an affordable way. Uh, some, for some people that's going to be really difficult where high prices are for property but in almost all urban areas you'll find there are unused spaces which have fallen out of use uh, over the years for different reasons. For example we've seen a few uh, projects working in underground car parks which are no longer in use or um, air raid shelters, uh, basements um, or just industrial units or office buildings which are no longer being rented by people, you often find you're able to uh, rent those units either at no cost or very low cost and bring them back into use, which is a great uh, bit of urban regeneration. Also, like all food growing projects, you're still going to be faced with the same challenges of finding your customers and scaling up your production. Um, but these things also, there are opportunities being based in a, in a city in the sense that you're right next to all the restaurants and the food outlets to 
uh, find your customers and get a good price for your produce, uh, but also that you can turn the project into more than just growing and selling food uh, by integrating people into it, um, either by training and workshops or farm tours and visits, uh, or by making it more of a charitable project whereby uh, different groups of people are coming in to learn skills as part of the project, so it's not just about growing food but also about uh, integrating people into it at the same time. So at this point you may be wondering why we're not still running a mushroom farm in the middle of the city. Uh, what happened with the project we ran in Exeter is that the lease for the building that we were in came to an end and we decided at that point in time to instead of set up another farm in the city to focus our time and attention elsewhere. At the time we had uh, recently launched our online course community and we were finding a lot of the course members were not actually in cities at all. Uh, lots of people were in more rural areas um, or small holdings and we're a social enterprise, a uh, non-profit social enterprise and our main aim is to teach people mushroom cultivation and we were just finding ourselves spread a little bit too thinly running a farm at a distance from where we actually live and so we decided to focus on the farm we've got here in the countryside and focus our time, energy and efforts on teaching and education uh, which is what we now spend most of our time doing every single day. So if you're interested to learn a bit more about mushroom growing and how to set up a low-tech mushroom farm, check out the guide below this video. Thanks a lot for watching, I hope you find it interesting and we'll see you soon.